So we're coming to the end of our series looking at the first few chapters of um, Colossians from which we've taken our vision statement. Uh, next week, Keith will be concluding it. Um, the verse that we're looking at is Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. It says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, can you continue, um, continue to live in him, um, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith, as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Well, next week, Keith will take the second part of that paragraph. Uh, this morning, it's a very limited text, which just says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord. And what we want to do, before we look at uh, moving forward, uh, we want to look back. Where did we come from? Uh, one of the famous quotes in Isaiah is uh, that he says to the people of God who are sort of losing their direction, um, and they've got loads of questions uh, about their destiny. He says, look to the rock from which you were hewn. And I, I think if we're clear on how and where we began, it gives us um, confidence and some direction for where we're going. Which is true, that's, that's why we endorse marriage and the covenant of marriage. And if at the beginning it's a covenant and not just cohabitation, then that covenant sets the direction and gives the parameters in which the, the marriage can be worked out. Without that beginning, then you're open to all sorts of things happening. So if we're clear where we began, it will help us understand where we're going. Um, if you have looked at the notes, and I know some people have, I wonder if you've taken time just to consider how did it all begin for you? What was your beginning? And uh, amongst us as a church, there's a variety of experiences. But at some point, <laughs> something must have began. And what was it when it crystallized, when it came in, into place? Um, Fiona, you know, come, come, we're, we're, we're going to sing. We're, we're going to sing. You don't have to sing. <coughs> but around our house, we, we um, Fiona will start a chorus and I'll join in or I'll jump on the piano and play it and something like this. And yesterday, and you, you know the format now, they're the old ones. Because <laughs> we're looking at our beginning, we're going back to our beginning. And I started singing and Fiona joined in and I had to play it on the piano. But uh, it, it says, um, We'll sing in the morning the songs of salvation. We'll sing in the the songs of his love and when we arrive at the end of our journey we'll sing the songs of Zion in the court above so we were singing that around the house yesterday <laughs> but that encapsulates <laughs> We're singing in the morning the songs of his <coughs> salvation. We're singing in the noontide the songs of his love. <coughs> and when we arrive at the end of our journey. And the hope always is that as you began, you will continue. And be aware that Paul, in this letter, he's concerned that people who began may not finish because they've lost their direction. Because we, we understand that the Christian life, it, and it, it says it here in Colossians, uh, that we've been made alive with Christ. There is a moment we are made alive with Christ. It needs to be continually strengthened and made firm. And one day we shall stand before him presented perfect, mature, complete. So it's that beginning, it's that continuation, and it's that culmination. And uh, Jesus talked, uh, the parable of the, the two builders on rock and sand, that the foundation is vital for what is going to develop. So I'm going to take that phrase, um, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord. And I've put down a series of questions, and I'm just going to look at the <coughs> first three. What does it mean to receive him, and to receive him as Lord? And what happened when we received Christ Jesus as Lord? And I'm going to take a, another text to... Um, develop that and it's the opening of John's Gospel 
um, where he, he says, uh, John writing about Jesus, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And before he's come to that point, John uh, paints a huge picture, the, the universal picture, that light has come into the world, but the darkness has not understood it. So you've got this huge contrast, light and darkness, and that's on the sort of cosmic scale. But then he brings it down, and he says, um, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognise him. So never mind light and darkness. This world that he made, he came there and he didn't, he wasn't recognised. And then John says, well let, let's go even in a smaller perspective. He came to his own. He came to the people of Israel, representative of people. He came to his own people, the covenant people of God. He came to that which was his own. But his own didn't receive him. So we've got light and darkness, and light, uh, darkness doesn't understand the light. The world that came from him doesn't recognise this is the author of your life. He comes to his own people, and they don't receive him. Then John says, yet to all who did receive him, he gave the right to become the children of God. How are those who received him described? What's it say? To all who received him, to those who believed on his name. So that's, that's our beginning. What, what does that mean, to, to believe in the name of Jesus Christ? Now, um, I've, we, as a church, and certainly Fiona and I, are very indebted to David Paulson, and I um, highly recommend his book, The Normal Christian Birth. And some of the things I'm saying has come out of that because it, it's one of the clearest expositions uh, that I, I think I've ever read of how people become uh, a Christian. And in it, David Paulson says that there's four elements to it, to believing in Jesus. There's a historical, there's a personal, there's a verbal, and there's a practical. The historical is, to believe on him, is actually to believe his story. From beginning to end, that he's the fulfilment of the Old Testament. We see the Gospels and we see the, uh, the, the um, works and the Acts and the letters and we read the Revelation. And it's to say, yes, actually, this story, his story, I believe. It's true. And you can analyse it, you can think it through. So it's historical. It isn't fictional. It's factual. But then it becomes not just something I believe because it's out there. It's something I believe because it's in here. I believe in him. I, I believe, I believe in him. It's a personal relationship. It's historical, but it's personal. Because in Colossians, Paul says, continue uh, just as you receive Christ Jesus, as you were taught. And there is something that needs to be within this Christian initiation, which engages our mind as well as our emotions. That I believe about him and I can put my trust in him because I understand who he is. Quite a few of us were at the Riding Light Sears a, a production here last night. And there were lots of poignant moments. Uh, one that particularly struck me was uh, the old shepherd who's suffering from de uh, dementia. And he's, he thinks in the field he's given, helped give a, a sheep give birth to a lamb. And he's holding this lamb. It's actually a cloth. But he, he's in his... Well, I was going to say fantasy world, but that isn't quite right. But he was in his own world. And then this cloth transforms <coughs> into a baby. And the, the whole scenario is that he is now Simeon in the temple, holding Jesus. And there was a poignant line. Here's this old shepherd who's lost his memory. And one of the family says to him, um, do you know who this is? And the old shepherd, he says, no, I don't I, I don't know who he is. And then they say to him, but he knows who you are. He knows who you are. <coughs> and when we're learning about the Lord, we're, we're trying to catch up uh, in our understanding. He knows everything about us. 
When we begin as a Christian, we don't know everything about Jesus. And we do need to be taught the faith. And it does need this historical element to it. Understanding his story. And then beginning to know him so I can receive him. And when I come to that point, um, that faith needs to be confessed. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. And I know people have different experiences, but at some point in your Christian life, you need to declare to somebody <laughs> that you're a Christian. It needs to be out there. It is not a personal, <coughs> private affair. And often that happens in baptism. And then it needs to be practical. Actually, I'm receiving him as Lord, and he is now in charge of my life. He, I, I'm trusting him to sort out the dynamics of my life. And it may be that, uh, well it will be, that, that our own story, as we receive Christ Jesus, will be very different for all of us. Um, and there might be gaps in our experience. Some of us might have had just a... a an emotional experience, a, a sense of the presence of God. But historically, we're, we're not too sure of the story. Maybe some people have never confessed that faith publicly. You need to do that. <coughs> David Porson again says, and he wrote this book because uh, in, um, in ordinary childbirth, if it's complicated, if it's delayed, um, if it's not done well, if it's, not, if it's mishandled, the, the child can suffer lifelong consequences. Mm -hmm. um, so he says, with Christians, if they're not delivered well, if they're not born right, if they, they're not taught how to receive Christ, there can be lifelong consequences as a Christian because they've never come into understanding what it is to be a Christian and how to receive Christ Jesus as Lord. And Paul goes on to say that as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, what's Lord mean? Loads of uh, phrases that are used. And throughout the gospel, they had a developing understanding of who Jesus was. At the beginning, they're calling him Sir. People call me Sir. <laughs> Around the prison, I get called Governor, I call IMB. Not many people, oh, you're a chaplain, are you? Um, but if they don't know my, my name, they call me Sir. I think, oh, that's very nice. <laughs> but that's how they call Jesus, Sir. Um, then it was Teacher. Then when he starts, the, they see he's calming the waves and turning bread into, uh, stones into, uh, not stones into bread. <laughs> Multiplying the bread, he never turned stones into bread. <laughs> it was wire, uh, water into wine, wasn't it? Doing all these sort of things. That, they actually uh, start calling him master because he's ruling and over demonic spirits. <laughs> and after the resurrection, he is called Lord because he is the conqueror of if he can come, if he can conquer over death. Mm -hmm. And so he is always known as Jesus Christ, the Lord. And we're called to to receive him. Not a sir, somebody just to be respectful. I like his teaching, I like his following. Uh, somebody, you know, well, I like some of the things he says. Or not even as a miracle worker. I asked for help and he came in and, you know, I was so grateful God was there when I needed him. Paul says, if you've been building on a firm foundation, you receive him. What do you receive him as? He comes in as Lord. It's an old phrase, but it, it, it's true. If Jesus isn't Lord, he's nothing. He won't play second fiddle. He won't be just an add-on. And John, going back to John, he says, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, uh, he gave the right to become the children of God. And it, it's, that's, that's the element of receiving Christ, not as the fairy godmother, not as the good luck charm, not as the cross that we wear around our neck for our protection, not as a first aid box that I can go to when I'm in trouble. We receive him as he comes, and that is Lord. In Genesis it says that God had the idea, let us make man in our own image. I think the cry today is from man, 
Let us make God in our own image. And when we're presenting the Christian faith, and when we're growing and developing in our own understanding, we need to be dealing with Jesus as Lord. Just as a sideline, in this book, the, new, the Normal Christian Birth, uh, David Paulson told the story that when the British Library catalogued it, they saw the title, The Normal Christian Birth, and uh, they, they filed it under um, gynecological, uh, <laughs> a Christian perspective. <laughs> and in that moment when we receive him, when we have this new birth by the Spirit, he says, you have the right, the authority. You're entitled to be, to be a child of God. That's what happened. The, um, the transactions happened to all who received him he gave the right. And if you receive him, you are a child of God. And the Holy Spirit comes in and witnesses it. So how did you become a Christian? Who acted first? You received him, so he came to you? Or was he looking for you before, <laughs> before you knew it? The Bible very clearly teaches that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And the same God who reached out to you and me when we were dead is the same God who's reaching out to everyone who doesn't know him yet. God's heart is that all should be saved. He doesn't delight in the death of any. And you became a Christian because God was looking for you. His love reached out. And we love him because he first loved us. It's our response to him. So as John says, he came to his own. He took the initiative and then people responded and received him. And so, so you know, oh, I found Jesus. And, uh, no, he found you. <clears throat> Is that how you began? Let me just like, very quickly look at the, the next three points. So what did God do in that moment? What did the Father do? What did the Son? What did the Holy Spirit do? What did you do? And how does that beginning help me to continue? So what did God do um, in that moment when I became a Christian, when I received him? Well, we understand that we, no, we state that God is three in one. We don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a, it's a tenet of our faith, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I've met people who are comfortable talking about Jesus, but, you know, God as a Father, or they, they're comfortable with the, the idea of a presence of the Spirit, but Jesus and some of the things he said and did are difficult. We need to understand that when, when we became a Christian, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all involved in that. God is indivisible. Jesus says, whoever seen me has seen the Father. If you receive me, you receive the one who sent me. When he goes, he says, I'm sending a, a spirit to, the Holy Spirit to be with you. It's just like me. You know him. And what did God do? It says that God came and made his home in our lives. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit he said, we'll, we'll have fellowship with you. The way we understand that is that the experience of that is by the Holy Spirit. I was mentioning that to Maddie, mm -hmm. you know, just as we're having coffee. How do I know? How do I know that I belong to Christ? And it is the witness of the Spirit, the Spirit residing within me. It's the work of the Spirit to confirm, to, to, to make that sure within me. So it's the experience which we have by the Holy Spirit by faith in the act of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me to reconcile me to the Father. So our, our faith is Trinitarian. The Spirit comes to point me to Christ so that I can have a relationship with, with God the Father. For us, it's the presence of the Holy Spirit that makes that all real. So it isn't just theoretical, it isn't historical. It's my present experience, the Holy Spirit has come 
and confirmed that I'm forgiven, I'm restored, I'm washed, and I'm filled. If that was what God was doing through the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what, 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 what did I do? What did you do to become a Christian? How did you begin? <laughs> what did you have to do? Or what still needs to be done? We've got a very simple formula. Repent, believe, be baptised, be filled with the Spirit. It's a very simple process. And it doesn't all happen in one moment. For some of us, we got a bit of the order <laughs> back to front and upside down and all <coughs> over the place. But for our experience, for, for us to continue in how we began, that foundation needs to be there. Repentance, just to turn away from what we know to be wrong. Be back, to, uh, believe. Repent, believe. Exercise real saving faith in the death of Jesus Christ. Sufficient. Total. All my sins on him were laid. Be baptised. And we think that's important. That's, uh, that is doing something which helps confirm the faith that uh, we're believing in and receive the Holy Spirit. David Porton, last quote from him, it says, different traditions have different emphasis. Um, and depending which church you go to, you can find that they, they play, lay emphasis on this. He said, the liberals emphasise repentance. Get your life sorted out. Uh, the in evangelicals emphasise faith. And, you know, uh, trust and belief. The sacramentalists... Uh, emphasise baptism, or they might even call it christening, and the way into the church is through baptism or christening, and the, the Pentecostals emphasise the work of the Holy Spirit, so the key thing is to be filled with the Spirit and speak in tongues and all that sort of stuff. Do you remember, I, I'm not sure if they're, they're still around, some have been turned into auction halls or garages, there used to be gospel halls around, do you remember? Yeah. Gospel halls? And some were called full gospel halls, <laughs> just in case you, you know, you missed out a bit on it. Well, we're not a full gospel hall, but we do believe in full gospel. And here in this church, we say, to get a good foundation, to have a good birth as a Christian, there needs to be evidence of repentance. You need to exercise faith in Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. You do need to get baptised. It's one of the commands of Jesus. And life will be so much easier for us as Christians if we're filled with the Spirit. We're not trying to do it by ourselves. And if for any people in the church and the orbit of the church there's gaps in that, gaps in your experience, we can help fill those gaps. We can take you through those steps. Let me conclude by just asking... How, how does this beginning, where Paul says, just as you receive Christ Jesus, and that's, a, that's a, what I've described is what we understand as a biblical uh, process, of biblical steps to becoming uh, a Christian. How does that beginning help me to continue to live in him? Some translations of verse 12 of John chapter 1 yet to all received him to those who believed in his name some translations some interpretation says to all who received him to those who continued to believe in his name he gave the right to become children of God that what we began with needs to be our daily experience it starts in a moment. Get, 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 some people are a bit vague, and I can't remember the day I, I would say I became a Christian. I, I, I remember as a child at, at seven having some experience, making some response in a meeting. Uh, the, the strange thing is that uh, I, what I do remember is that, that there, was a, there was an appeal to come and people kneel forward, come and kneel down. So I went and knelt, but I knelt on a drawing pin. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's my <laughs> And that was, a, that was a genuine response as a seven-year-old. Um, and then I remember pinnacle moments, but uh, I, I remember mm -hmm. a, a moment in a, in a Salah Army meeting where 
something really clicked for me. I couldn't put a date. Fiona can give you the date. I can't give you the date. I can tell you the event. <laughs> not, my, not mine, yours. Not yours yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, I feel like I can tell. Um, but it, 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 there needs to be that start. And then there needs to be that continuation. What I want to say is the last point. I received, when I received Christ, the whole of my being was involved in that. So just remember what I said, it's historical, it's personal, it's verbal, and it's practical. When I become a Christian, the whole of my being is involved in that. My mind is involved in that. I understand what I believe. It's not just an emotional response. The emotions might be involved in that, but actually I've looked at the facts, I've looked at the testimony, the evidence, and I believe that to be true. So my mind is engaged in becoming a Christian. My will is submitted because I'm confessing him as Lord. You're the boss, you're the master. You, you have the right to say what goes and what doesn't go. That's what Jesus is as Lord. My heart is stirred. I, I, my life becomes uh, what Paul says, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. It, it, it's his life within us and his presence within us fills us with the presence of God and our emotions and our heart is stirred by that. And my body is consecrated. What Paul says to the Romans, he says, offer yourselves as living sacrifices. And that's your spiritual worship. That what I do with this body that God has given me belongs to the Lord. So my mind, my will, my heart and my body, at the beginning, I offered them to, to the Lord. What, do you remember the old hymn, take my life and let it be? Consecrated. Yeah. And when we say that, that's a whole that's a whole of my being. And if that's how we begin, that's the foundation that we built on. Body, mind, and spirit are all involved in that. Then Paul says, now continue with that. And people lose lose their way when they don't submit every thought and make it captive to Christ. And they don't conform. They don't take the word, the truth of the word of God and let it train and teach their, their conscience, their thinking. When the will becomes rebellious, and I just don't want to do it. Well, you have that choice. As it says in the, to the churches in Revelation, you've lost your first love. When our hearts grow cold. Or when, just with the, the, the physical frame God has given us, we, we do things, we get involved in stuff which uh, as Paul says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit you know, keep it clean keep it pure so just as you receive Christ Jesus if you receive him in that way continue and strengthen I hope that's helpful um, Keith is, next week is going to talk about how we continue strengthen in him and we're saying this because this is the gospel we preach if we're going to invite people to become Christians and in the elders meeting the comment was made within the church we're, we're just questioning do we have that expectation that people are going to come to faith are we expecting people to be born again through our ministry and our, through our teaching but we all, as a church need to be clear this is what we're inviting people to <coughs> You must be born again. And we want people to receive Christ and, and bring them to new birth in a healthy, whole way. So let's pray. Lord, for all those of us here who've got that witness of the Holy Spirit within us, that we're born of God, we want to thank you. We thank you that your grace and your love reached down when we didn't deserve it, when for some of us we weren't even looking for you. We just knew that prompting within us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we heard <clears throat> something stirring within us. There was a call that we began to respond to. And I thank you, Lord, that uh, we can say, yeah, as you've received us, and you received us just as we were in the state we were in, so we're glad that we ever received you as our Lord and Saviour. We're so blessed that we, we've come to know you as the living God, not to whose 
um, remote and distant, but as a, 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 a someone in our life and uh, permeating through every aspect of our life. And here we do make the confession that Jesus Christ, you are Lord. And we make the confession that you are our Lord. And as we um, look to the end of this year and the beginning of the new year, we want, we want the, this, the power of this gospel to be touching many people's lives. The people that we connect with, the people who come to messy church after hours, people who come to Sunday meetings, the conversations we're involved with people. Yes. Lord, we want that they come to know you and to know you as life and life in all its fullness. But Lord, I pray that you will teach us by your Holy Spirit so that we can help people in the right way. We can strengthen one another. We, we can encourage and train and teach one another. But when people are coming into your kingdom, that they have a good, healthy birth here, Lord. So that they grow up mature, complete, lacking in nothing. In Jesus' name.